There we go. Excellent. I'm so excited to see everybody tonight. Welcome, I'm Heather Montgomery and I'm happy to serve as a volunteer and to host this live event for the Land Trust of North Alabama. I don't know about you all, but I've been extremely grateful for the trails and outdoor opportunities on the Land Trust preserves during the pandemic. Wow, did you know that there are 70 miles of trails over 7,000 acres in five different counties and year round educational programs provided for free to the, by the Land Trust. It's a great opportunity. And then we also have a virtual opportunities like tonight. I'm really excited because I'm gonna be learning some things tonight. Join us as award-winning author and conservationist Bill Finch and Alabama A&M wildlife researcher Patience Knight discuss North Alabama's fascinating biodiversity. The focus tonight will be on the groundbreaking work being done at the Paint Rock Forest Research Center, an effort comprised of the world's top evolutionary and systems biologist. The research center has been conducting intricate studies in the Paint Rock Valley that seek to, ter to de determine what holds forest communities together, what species are more likely to survive and where, and how forests react to increase carbon and climate change. To find out what makes North Alabama such an unequaled location for this project and why conservation of these areas is so imperative for our community and beyond, you'll get some clues tonight. Just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, we welcome comments and questions in the, in the comment section of Facebook. We'll hold some time at the end of the session for question and answer. So please submit your questions as we go along. We'll be collecting them. And now, it's my honor to introduce our speakers. Bill Finch is a writer, environmental journalist, and a conservation planner. He and his wife, conservation photographer Beth Maynard Finch, are principals in the consulting service Finch Conservation and put together the acclaimed book Longleaf, as far as the eye can see. If you haven't seen that book, you have to get your eyes on that. His award-winning weekly columns appear in Alabama's three largest newspapers, he has a weekly radio show and he's a founding director of the Paint Rock Forest Research Center. Bill has been involved in Alabama conservation for more than 30 years and he kind of acts as if, as if the world revolves around plants, which of course it does. And our second presenter tonight uh, is Patient Knight. Patience is currently employed at the Alabama A&M University as a forestry technical research associate and the Paint Rock Project field coordinator. She's earned a dual BS in wildlife management and range management from Texas Tech University and a master's in plant and soil sciences from Alabama A&M University. Her research focused on the effects of prescribed burning on feral swine habitat use and the activity in the Bankhead National Forest. Research she's participated in ranges from stream morphology and riparian water quality to various wildlife surveys, including aquatic macroinvertebrates, one of my favorites, fish, small and medium-sized mammals, and pig sign, all the way to forest and riparian habitat surveys. Wow, we're in for a treat tonight. We've got some experts. I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to speaker view so that you can see them front and center. All right. Yeah. So, ready? Let's. Uh, we're gonna. We're gonna try a, a little bit of uh, high technology here. We're gonna share screens. We'll give me just a second to try to do that. There we go. Pop. Does it? Uh, everybody seeing it pretty well? Now we are. Yeah. Oh, good. 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 So let, let's. Uh, let me ask you some questions. Um, Alabama is a, is, a, is a pretty nice state and, and we live here and for that reason we have an allegiance to it and we also of course have a a football team that we talk about. Uh, you can talk about your own football teams and so it's, it's, a, it's a great state, right? But I, I always think we forget that fundamentally Alabama is not just a nice place to live uh, and not just a place with a good football team it is a state that makes a huge difference to the future of North America. And maybe we'd rather that weren't true. I, I often think we'd rather that we didn't make that much difference, but the fact of the matter is we do. 
Uh, we have always made a difference. This landscape has always made a huge difference. And our activities in this landscape uh, play a much larger role than, you know, go up to Minnesota, uh, affect that landscape a little bit. You won't have a huge impact on most of North America. Everywhere you step in this place, you're having a huge impact on the future of North America. Let me give you some reasons why things you may not know. The, the center of forest diversity in North America is squarely in Alabama. It's not North Carolina, it's not Georgia, it's not Florida, it's certainly not California or Washington state. The center of tree diversity in North America is in Alabama. Uh, the greatest concentration of trees is in the Red Hills of Alabama. The center of oak diversity in North America, north of Mexico is Alabama. Center of magnolia diversity is Alabama. The center of hickory diversity in the world is Alabama. The center, and, and not just in forests, the center of grass diversity in Eastern North America is Alabama. The center of turtle diversity in the Western hemisphere is Alabama. Center of fish diversity, the center of mussel diversity, the center of snail diversity in most cases uh, with mussels and snails, probably in the world, with fish, certainly in North America, it's all Alabama. And so anytime we move, anytime we step, we have a huge impact on the future of North America because Alabama has over many, many millennia shared its diversity with the rest of the country. When there were glaciers creaming down all the way to Washington DC, where do you think the forest was? Where do you think all these oaks and hickories and magnolias were? Hmm. So there it is, it's an important place. And what do we do about that? Uh, what do we do about that? Well, uh, a few years ago, a guy named Stephen Hubble uh, came to me. He's at UCLA, he was head of the evolutionary biology department at UCLA. At the time I had been working with uh, Ed Wilson, E.O. Wilson, who was at Harvard on conservation projects in Alabama. I was working for the Nature Conservancy. And Hubble came and, and talked to both of us about, uh, about some of his plans uh, for research. And he said, you know, I really want to set up a research plot in the most diverse forest in North America that helps me to understand how trees work here. We did it in the tropics, Hubble said, 40 something years ago. We did this at Barro, Colorado and it has changed the way we understand how tropical forests work. It's even changed the way we understand species. I wanna do that in North America. Where's the best place to do it? And we talked about North Carolina. We talked about, we talked about South Alabama, which is a really cool place. We talked about Apalachicola, Florida. We talked about Northwest Georgia. We talked about the Rebecca Mountains and Central Alabama. We even talked about the Dismas. We talked about uh, the area around the Bankhead, but we kept coming back to a place in Northeast Alabama where I've been doing work for a while and that I felt was really distinctive. It was the Paint Rock Valley. And so we began to work on that, that program here. And let me, uh, let me move you through some of these slides if I can. So there's Hubble uh, with the Smithsonian Forest Research Center. He is now a uh, distinguished professor emeritus, developed a theory of understanding how forests work called the neutral theory. Ooh, you don't want me to talk about that right now. It'll give you a headache, but it is a, it is a fascinating new way of looking at uh, how ecosystems work, why rareness occurs, how often rareness occurs. It was a really, really interesting question. And so we began looking. Lubin Demoff was at Alabama A&M at the time. And uh, this was a number of years ago. He and Rick Condit uh, came and we began, we do a lot of this neck craning out here because this forest that we were looking at was a nature conservancy forest on about 4,500 acres. And it's an incredible forest here in the middle of Paint Rock. It is, it, uh, the trees are very mature. Uh, and so you're always having to look up to see what you're looking at. Uh, you, you get kind of a neck ache uh, from, from walking through this forest because you're always looking up into this beautiful forest. Rick Condit helped us to develop the protocol here. Ed Wilson 
E.O. Wilson, some of you may have heard of E.O. Wilson. I hope you have. Well, probably the greatest scientist uh, produced in Alabama, one of the most famous scientists worldwide, certainly the most famous evolutionary biologist alive uh, at Harvard, Ed Wilson came down and began thinking with us, how do we develop a research program? And Ed said, you know, I like what, I like what Steve's doing, but you know, I want this to be the woods hole of forest research. I want this to be a great center of forest research. Woods Hole in Massachusetts, one of the great centers of marine research. He said, I want it to be the Scripps Center, one of these, uh, a great center of research uh, in California. He wanted this to be a world-class center. He wants this to be a world-class center. And he said, I want to understand everything. <laughs> so I don't want to make this simple. I want you to tell me everything that's going on in this forest. Whew. So he got involved and we began planning with Patty Gawati, uh, another evolutionary biologist uh, at UCLA. He's one of the great, uh, I guess you could call her the feminist biologist. She changes the way we understand gender and, and its role in sex selection. We should have a whole talk about that one day. It's fascinating. And, uh, and we all began planning uh, how to set up this research program on the 4,500 acre mature forest preserve in Northeast Alabama in Jackson County. Uh, the core of this research is a 60 hectare, 150 acre plot uh, in which we, uh, we set up grids, uh, a 20 by 20 meter grids, 60 by 60 foot grids, and we determine every stem greater than one centimeter. We measure every stem greater than one centimeter. Put a, put a, uh, put a little red line on it and, and put a tag on it, giving each stem a number uh, and, and then identify it, measure it. And then we census that stem over 50 years. An incredible baseline. Patients can talk a little bit more about how we do that. That's about 100,000 stems will be following in the 60 hectare plot. And there will probably be an expansion of that. That's just the base of our research. This is where we are. Many of you know that uh, we're in the Southern Cumberlands region, which is increasingly being seen as an important region of, of North America in terms of its biodiversity. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. There's the 4,500 acre preserve uh, in the Paint Rock Valley, not too far up the valley. You know, the valley's a long thing, 35 miles long. Uh, it's, it's relatively isolated because it's hard to gain access to it. Uh, but because of that, it's just the diversity is amazing. And you can see the slopes uh, and, uh, and this incredible karst system that's there as well. Uh, the a big picture of the valley broadly. Karst is very important here. Caves, the center of cave diversity in North America, as many of you may know, both in terms of the number of caves and in the species that inhabit caves, another Alabama superlative, it's in Jackson County. Amazing center of cave diversity. And the caves play a huge role on what happens above ground. That's one of the things we're beginning to study. They are uh, giant caves, caves of all types on the property. This one you could fly an airplane into. Uh, it's really a remarkable cave. Uh, caves that uh, go straight down, uh, beautiful keel sinks, cave uh, that's uh, a picture taken from a natural bridge next to that cave. Uh, and then the sandstone tops, incredible diversity from the sandstone tops uh, all the way down into these sinks with the bluebells, one of the most famous bluebell displays. I mean, certainly this, this part of the Tennessee Valley around Huntsville is famous for its bluebells. Probably the best display of bluebells anywhere. Uh, there's lots of other cool things, but, uh, but this, is, this is pretty neat. Uh, orchids of all kinds, uh, trout lilies, trilliums. You know where the center of trillium diversity is in North America? Mm -hmm. Paint Rock Valley. <laughs> uh, it's kind of amazing. Greatest concentration of trillium diversity in North America. Twin leaf, a rare plant most places, really abundant here. And then the trees, just these massive, giant trees, incredible diversity of trees. Let me tell you something about uh, a tree diversity. Great Smoky Mountains National Park. We think of that as sort of the center of North American tree diversity, right? 500,000 acres in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, there are 12 species of oaks. Uh, 
Patience has surveyed about eight hectares. How many oats have we got in, in, in uh, those eight hectares, patients? I think we have about 12. Yeah, I think so. That's probably about right. <laughs> Assuming we could all, you know, get them all uh, correctly identified, yes. Yeah, yeah. So we've got some problems. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But incredible diversity. I mean, the tree diversity in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, we could probably compare this 4,500-acre tract it would probably be almost as diverse as the entire Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Really extraordinary diversity. We've got eight, we, 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 we have eight known species of hickory that are gonna show up on the plot. We have another hickory that we can't figure out what it is. <laughs> so we may have nine taxa of, of hickory. Uh, we've got, we've got uh, some other species problems, identification problems. Buckeyes are incredible. One of the great centers of Buckeye diversity. Alabama is the Buckeye state, in case you had any doubts. Uh, we, we have uh, virtually all the Buckeyes in North America. We have all the Buckeyes in North America. Uh, and, uh, and Ohio doesn't, has maybe one or two. Uh, but we've got uh, this beautiful Sylvatica. This is Aeschylus Sylvatica, one of the most beautiful of all the Buckeyes. Uh, but we also have three other species of Buckeye likely on the preserve. Smoke trees, weird things like smoke trees. When we talk all day about smoke trees, this incredibly beautiful plant. Uh, the old legend was is that it built the ark. You need to know that that would be the ark of the covenant, not Noah's ark. Uh, whether it actually built the ark of the covenant, I'll let you debate with the locals. But it's an incredibly cool tree. It's a very rare tree. It has a spotty distribution right here in Madison County, in Jackson County. It skips up into a few counties in Tennessee, and then it skips over to Missouri, and then to Texas. What is going on? Why does that have such a rare distribution? And why is it so common here in Paint Rock? An absolutely beautiful, really cool tree. Uh, and, and the other problem with Paint Rock is we continue to run into species nobody's ever heard of. Nobody's ever put a name on. We don't even know what to call them. This is a new Robinia related to black locust, has beautiful flowers, as you can tell. We still don't know what it is. Nobody knows what it is. We're going to have to put a new name on it. There's a new, there are new oak, uh, there's a new azalea, uh, almost certainly that's been overlooked forever uh, along, the highland, uh, along the highland rim and here, uh, where, the, uh, where the Cumberland Plateau breaks down into the valleys. We don't know what it is. It's very distinctive. We're going to have to put a new name on it. And then there's this thing. We didn't expect this at all. So we're looking at these oaks and we say, what kind of oak is that? And they said, well, it may be a Schumard, but we brought in the top experts and they said, hmm, ain't a Schumard. We almost certainly have a new oak species here on this plot that's never been named. We could go on. It's a really cool oak. Uh, how we overlooked it for this long is uh, a story about how people view the forest and how people view Alabama's forest. Uh, we don't uh, give them probably the respect they deserve, and we always underestimate uh, what's in those forests. New maples, we got maples, we don't know what they are. Uh, the, the dean of taxonomy for North America came and said, what is that? Salamander diversity, incredibly high, probably the center of land snail diversity. Bird diversity is really remarkable. Ask me about it. We've got lots to talk about where birds are concerned, all sorts of wildlife. And we're doing all kinds of experiments, trying to look at other micro uh, inhabitants of this system. So we're doing eDNA, uh, environmental DNA, and streams and other things, trying to figure out what's there. Incredible forest, a, a beautiful forest uh, in, in the Paint Rock Valley, which, by the way, has a long association with humans. And that's the other thing we're studying here is the human impact on these forests. Uh, we recognize that humans have been here for thousands of years and we're increasingly finding stunning evidence of human habitation here for thousands of years and human impacts on these forests that need to be studied and, and better understood. Uh, an, an incredible place. So here's the thing. Incredible diversity, an incredible center of diversity, the center of deciduous forest diversity in North America, the center of trillium diversity, probably going to be the center, uh, the greatest concentration of oaks that I have ever seen, of, of hickories that I have ever seen anywhere. We could go on with the diversity, new species left and right, 
new violets, new lobelias, incredible diversity. But we said, it doesn't make sense to study this forest. We won't understand this forest if we don't see this diversity here in Northeast Alabama with the eyes of diversity. So one of the first things we did was to set up a special relationship with Alabama A&M. Uh, and historically black college uh, and university uh, that, uh, and, and we, we worked with A&M to get a USDA grant so that students at Alabama a and could participate in the research. And Alabama a and participation has been fundamental to this research program. The, the person who's leading our field research and the person I interact with most is Patience Knight. She's on our board at the Paint Rock Forest Research Center here. Uh, I'm gonna let Patience talk a little bit uh, about the kind of things that, uh, that, that, uh, that her group is doing here in the forest. Patience. Uh, thanks, Bill. Uh, largely, Bill's already covered it. We're doing an inventory of all the trees and woody species out there that are at least one centimeter in diameter at breast height and, a, and a bigger. Uh, we've come across lots of different types of species, and we've had the pleasure of training a good handful of students. Um, that was part of the fun that we had last year, and we got it going up again this year recently after uh, coronavirus came through. Um, We've been able, like he said, we did eight hectares last year, and they're already through about a hectare in the first two and a half weeks this year. And this year we're getting into a really cool area that's different from last year. It's a uh, more bottomland, and uh, that's more of the more wetland species of trees. And so it's a really cool opportunity for them to get to learn how communities change with soils and with uh, different areas up on top of the mountain versus down into uh, some of the washy areas. And um, we're really getting to see bigger trees down there. And it's a great experience for them to get to map all of these trees. It's something that we've uh, really concentrated on this time around was their training. So they're having to, like Bill said, tag all of these trees and uh, we measure them for all of their diameters. We identify all of the species that we have there. And um, yeah, these are great pictures of the team we had last year. I believe we had seven people on our team last year. Uh, very smart, quick to uh, jump onto uh, what we're already doing. And they would enjoyed themselves out there. So it was a, we had a great time, even while learning how to do all of these uh, different inventories and learning how to do this project correctly. Um, we've also been able to bring out other groups, and that's something that's really cool because we're hoping to have collaborations with other universities and to be able to do outreach here. Um, I know Bill's already gotten some scientists involved that are hoping to look at the DNA of a lot of the trees that we have in our area, and that'll be really cool to see how much genetic diversity we have and uh, whether we have new species or lots of hybrids how trees might actually grow differently across different types of uh, habitats within our area. So uh, that's another exciting thing that we're looking forward to. Um, this year, because of corona coronavirus, we've had to change up our techniques some. Uh, we have uh, Helen Check. she just came on as our new dendrologist, but she also established COVID uh, protocols to keep us all safe while we're working. We're still outside, but we want to make sure that we maintain uh, safety so we wear masks and uh, it makes it a bit more complicated than last year, but we're able to really concentrate and stay safe, do all of our work. And uh, we've got a great new crew and we're hoping to really train recently graduated students and uh, help them get them some experience and uh, run this crew year round instead of just in the summer. But at the same time, we'll be able to uh, this year, we've concentrated a little bit more on doing some video training so that we can come back and train our own undergraduates and get them ready for these kinds of studies and um, hopefully to have them involved in this study itself. Um, beyond that, uh, Bill, is there anything else you wanted me to cover? Yeah, you know, I think you can comment on this, but we, we both can comment on this. One of the interesting things is that this is the first time that a lot of these students have been involved in a forest like this. And, and, and for some, uh, the, we have a whole generation that really hasn't been involved in forests at all. 
And, and you, you wonder how folks are gonna react when they get out uh, in a very wild place that will seem to most people very remote. And they get to see some of our favorite friends uh, like uh, Tibber rattlesnakes. And they get to see those things and they get to give them names and they do that and they get used to it. And it's, it's really an interesting experience to see this younger generation uh, become attached uh, to nature in the way that they are and, and, and be open to it. And they really are remarkably. So one of the great things I think this program does is just introduces a new generation uh, to nature in a very intimate way and in, in, a very, in a way that piques their interest in science. And we hope to train here a new generation uh, in natural history uh, who can do uh, what needs to be done for Alabama over the next century uh, and who can help to uh, maintain Alabama as a great center of diversity. Yeah, any, any good stories, patients, about uh, kids in the, in the forest <laughs> for the first time? Well, it is like you said, and actually I was surprised. Um, I know that they want to come in as part of the project to get experience, and I thought that they'd be focused on the forest and the trees. But um, even while we're doing their work out there, they're very interested in the different kind of wildlife. So, you know, when we're quiet, we might hear a shrew running around and they take video of shrews and photos of shrews, um, various invertebrates, uh, different kind of mushrooms and things like that, spiders. Uh, they get to learn so much more. And it's one of those uh, things that they might've been afraid of before, like you said, timber rattlesnakes. Uh, black racers, different types of spiders and other things, they really get to learn more about them. And they're not afraid anymore. It's one of those things they get more and more comfortable in the forest. And uh, that's something that I think they could help spread on and have a kind of a ripple effect. Um, if I had been more prepared, I would have brought some of the pictures because we, we have <laughs> dozens and dozens of pictures that they've taken from being out there. And so uh, that is a, an exciting side effect of this project that's really cool, especially for people who haven't been in the forest. We've had people who have only worked in biology labs and they just wanted to get introduced to the outdoors. He's got a picture of a, one of the students I'm talking about right now. And really she just, she wanted to learn more about the outdoors and kind of uh, experience it more. And she had a great time. Uh, it's unfortunate we couldn't bring her back this year because of uh, COVID and um, with her being still in school. But it's, it's really making people get a different per, uh, perspective and gain a greater appreciation for our force and for nature. So uh, it's a great opportunity to, uh, like you said, train the next generation and really get people more familiar and more comfortable with the natural resources here. Yeah. So just uh, some of the things, this is our plot you, do you see the little red uh, long triangle in the midst of the larger red uh, bumpy uh, outline of the, of the whole preserve? That red triangle is our research plot. Uh, we could talk a lot about why we set it up the way we did, but it's really cool, it's really neat, it's really a great spot. And we have a lot of time working, uh, great time working in this forest uh, with all of its beautiful scenery but it's more than a beautiful place. It's an incredibly important place. And that's the thing we have to remember about Alabama. Sometimes we say, oh, well, this is a nice backdrop for a McDonald's, but maybe, maybe it's more important than that. Uh, maybe it has the future of North America's forest and its ecology and even its climate uh, in, in the hands of what's going on in this forest. We'd love to talk about all of the research here the impact on the Paint Rock River, of course, one of the most diverse rivers uh, in, uh, in North America. It's fair to say it's probably, it's extraordinary in the Tennessee Basin. And I'm, I'm trying to quantify that. The walls of Jericho at the, at the top of the Paint Rock Valley uh, are incredibly scenically beautiful. Uh, all of these things are worthy of preserving. One of the things we realized is, is that we've got about 450,000 acres in the greater Paint Rock ecosystem that we need to plan for so that it's still here uh, in, uh, for coming generations. And so a big part of our mission is not just the research, not just training folks, but also setting up a great conservation plan, working with Lindhurst and OSI, Open Space Institute, and Conservation Fund and the Nature Conservancy. And of course, 
the Land Trust of North Alabama to really develop a great conservation plan for the greater paint rock ecosystem. And if you look, it's not just paint rock. There are something like 12 to 15 million acres in the Southern Cumberlands that are in better shape than almost any other stretch of forest in North, in, in North America. Incredible uh, continuity of forest uh, and, and remarkable place. It's been totally overlooked. We think of the Cumberlands as the working forest of North America, the coal forest, but you know, for the most part, it's really incredibly intact uh, and incredibly beautiful. And it's, it's a place, if we're going to have a corridor as climate changes for species to move north again, which is what Alabama has always done, shared its species with the rest of North America, we need to begin planning for the Cumberlands. So our, our paint rock project, our research helps us to understand how we do this cons conservation, how we can, how these forests affect climate, how they're going to respond to climate, how changes in climate are going to affect forest and where we do our conservation work. So it's, uh, it's, it's incredibly important uh, that we uh, continue to develop a conservation plan here. And that's something I hope we'll be working with the North Alabama Land Trust on. Mike Dalen, uh, you'll recognize some of these people. Some of you uh, who are on this call are probably in some of these pictures. Uh, Cindy Ragland's working with us with Tau League of Forest, James Lowry. Patience, of course, is one of our board members. Will McGarity, uh, Nature Conservancy. We've got folks from Wisconsin uh, uh, and from all over participating, Pete Conroy. Uh, and I'm gonna try to find some of you in these pictures as I'm scrolling through as quickly as I can, because I know you're in there. Uh, let's see, you're in there somewhere. Oh, lots of different people. Here we go. David, David Lubatazzi, there you are. <laughs> I told you. So uh, we, we've, uh, we've brought a, a group from North Alabama Land Trust out. We hope to bring more of you out and show you what we're doing as we're developing. COVID has made it harder for us to do that. Uh, but uh, we'll be through this one day. And when we are, uh, we hope to have you out here more often uh, participating in what we do. Uh, you know, we, we have prompted, uh, we've talked enough. Uh, we could talk a long time, but I would like for you all to be able to uh, ask a lot of questions about what we're doing here and we can address them specifically. Is it, Heather, is this a good time to turn this over to, uh, uh, to questions? Yeah, we can always uh, take some questions and I've got a few that we can uh, pose. Um, do you want to stop, maybe stop sharing the screen so we can? Yeah, that's great. So how do I, I will go down to. I think if you. Stop there's share. A, there's a little mm -hmm. button that says stop share. That's simple there's, enough. Good. There's always that option, right? And I'll bring us all up here on the screen together. So thank you, man. I love that. I learned so much. I got so excited about the biodiversity and plants. You two are really into plants, which is really, really cool. I have a, an animal question though for you because I realized some of the folks uh, listening might not know what a shrew is. So can you can you fill us in on what a shrew is? <laughs> That's yours. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's something that I learned when I first started my job here in Alabama as well. It's a small mammal, they're insectivores, and they're the only venomous mammal, I believe, in the world. Um, the one that we have around here is called the short-tailed shrew. Uh, the Latin name, I believe, is Blorina carolinensis. And it, it really is only that big, but it's a voracious predator and it's fossorial and lives in the leaf litter. Mm -hmm. So you can only really hear it and know that it's there if you're quiet. And we, heard, we actually heard it and looked down and for a minute, it looked like the leaf letter had a heartbeat. So it was just pumping like that. And we were like, what, what is that? And it came out. Um, they can resemble moles a little bit. They have reduced eyes, reduced ears. But um, they actually use, um, oh golly, uh, kind of like bats. They use sonar to uh, navigate their ways through, through places. So they're a cool little mammal that a lot of people don't know about. That's awesome. You know, isn't that amazing how much is right here? We don't, we just don't know what's in our backyard, right? That is, I love learning all these little facts. And I know people think that, you know, a venomous mammal is a really neat thing too. So, so from that question, we'll go to a kind of a more serious one. Um, 
In the work you've done so far, what effects of climate change have you seen in the paint rock? Well, we are, we are still in the middle of the census, and so it's, it's harder to tell. We won't know until we begin to do back-to-back -back census, and we can look at how, uh, how fast species grew and what species dropped out. Uh, so that's a thing that we're going to find out more and more as time goes on. There's some very interesting things to do with climate, though, that I think we're probably unaware of. Uh, the Paint Rock Valley is, is, is virtually a rainforest. That's awesome. uh, it, it's, uh, it's getting, uh, it's one of the few places in the country that gets right at 70 inches of rain. Uh, Mobile does, uh, uh, the Paint Rock Valley does, the Upper Valley does, and most of our plot does. Huntsville, Huntsville gets a, a meager 58 inches of rain a year. Uh, it's, uh, it's really quite incredible. Rainfall is changing in paint rock, and we've already seen that, and we see the impact on the forest. If you, um, changes in be huge, and what we're seeing is a lot more gully washers. Let me just put it that way. And, and that is beginning to have a big impact on the forest and on the streams, and it's something we have to think about. The other thing I'll say is, looking at the data, uh, we already know that the climate is changing here, but in ways that maybe are counterintuitive. Uh, our growing season in Northeast Alabama is actually getting shorter, amazingly enough. Even as our winters are generally getting warmer, we don't have as many cold days and we don't have, uh, we don't have the lows, extreme lows that we used to have. So one way to understand that, and this is very important, it's gonna have a huge impact on plants, and a huge impact on you. The nights are getting warmer, not the days. And as the nights get warmer, it has a lot of plants can't deal with that very well. And that's going to have a huge impact. Uh, and we expect to be, we expect to see that. So you're not going to be growing palm trees in Huntsville, uh, but uh, you are going to be seeing the impact of warmer nights, more humid nights you're gonna see a lot more pathogens, a lot more things like um, certain types of mosquitoes that you don't have now, and certain types of ticks and certain types of diseases. And the trees are gonna suffer uh, from diseases that they don't suffer from now because the nights are getting warmer and because the winters are not as cold as they used to be. So we know we're gonna see those effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for filling us in on that. You know, one of the things that the Land Trust has is we have a, a fabulous crew of volunteers. And I think it's really been neat to hear, especially patients you talking about what the students are getting out of kind of helping you. Do you all have plans for uh, volunteer crews to work? Um, we did that... last year. Unfortunately, yeah. since the coronavirus hit, we're not allowing volunteers at the moment. Um, However, in the future, as long we might be able to fit in some extra protocols to allow for volunteers, we'll, we'll just have to see how it goes. We have to take it slowly. Sure, that's totally understood. It's really, um, it's really powerful when organizations can partner in those ways. And I think it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity. I love hearing about the uh, educational aspects of, of your, your operation. Um, I'm kind of curious, just from me personally, like, where did your interests in nature begin? For oh, the two of you. Yeah, we're, how did you get into this? <laughs> um, funny story, actually, um, I was a military brat. And so we moved all over the place. And one of the first places I can really remember getting an appreciation for nature was uh, going off to camp in the summer when I lived in Florida. And ever since then, nature's always had an appeal, you know, it's, it's beauty is captivating. And so that's one way I appreciate nature. And then growing up, I was an athlete. So we were always outside. So it's, it's those things together. Um, when I started at Tech, I figured, you know, it's like something, I, I wanna do something that I can go outside with. Mm -hmm. And that's where I kind of started with wildlife and range management. And um, I'm grateful to have gotten the opportunity when I moved here to be a forest wildlife uh, technician so uh, it's something that I can continue to grow and learn from. And it's been a lot of fun. That's wonderful. Yeah, I know I spend so much time out on preserves and uh, yeah, just making that connection. What about you, Bill? What, how did you get interested in this? 
Hmm. Well, I grew up in rural Mississippi and rural Alabama, and uh, you entertained yourself uh, in the woods, and I entertained myself in the woods, uh, hiking through them, uh, riding horses through them, uh, walking through the cane break, listening to Bobcats. I remember uh, as a very young age, uh, and I remember one of the greats, uh, I think my first real, it, what dawned on me is that I really was interested in plants was I was running through the woods one day and ran into this big shrub. It was just full of these flaming red flowers that just, it scared me. It was so brilliant. It was so amazing. And I thought, what in the world is that? And no one could tell me what it was. And for years I went around with this image of this incredibly red fiery bush in my head uh, that scared me in the middle of the woods, wondering what it was and wanting to know. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think it, I think I probably it wasn't until I went to college that I realized it was a red buckeye. Uh, and people didn't know. I mean, no, people didn't know what they were looking at. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was my desire to, to, to understand these things that I was looking at that, that really drove me to, uh, to, to work more and more with forests and, and forestry. Uh, and environmental issues and natural natural heritage. I love that. It's neat to think about how one experience could really kind of help someone find a career. And I think that's a really positive thing about families getting out, especially now. Um, I see a lot of families out on the preserves and it's fabulous. And just to think that one little experience like that could be the thing that, you know, if you follow it, if you follow that interest, you can, you can do amazing things. Now we have a, a longer question here. Um, are there any human caused impacts of concern to the paint rock area besides climate change uh, that you want to share, such as development or pollution for our, uh, from more populated areas? Sure. Uh, the paint rock uh, has lost its floodplain almost entirely. Uh, and uh, it's a huge impact. Most rivers in the Tennessee Valley have lost their floodplain. And what that means is, is that people downstream are seeing floods a lot more often. If, if you want to look at it from a human perspective, flooding is, is, is much worse. It's much harder to control floods than it would have been otherwise because streams no longer have access to a floodplain. How did that happen? It's something called channelization. Streams have been turned, many streams that, uh, that go into the paint rock have been turned from sinuous, beautiful little creeks, meandering creeks into these ditches that just run straight slap dab and they've got levees around them so that the water can never escape these narrow ditches. And that has destroyed um, large acres of habitat. Tiling has made a huge impact as well. Uh, we can talk uh, later about that. But yeah, I would have to say in the Paint Rock Valley, that's, that's one of the big things. It's, uh, and it's something we're, we're gonna be thinking about. How do you do farming? without having those huge impacts. And I think there are probably ways of thinking about that in new ways. It's part of our mission. I'm trying not to give you a headache by talking about all the things we think about, but it is part of our mission uh, to think about how do we do these things so that the river itself is not so severely impacted? Uh, could development be a problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we, we, count, the, uh, we count the miles from the, from the uh, next McDonald's. And uh, it's, uh, it, can be a, it can be a big impact. Uh, and even we find big acreages where, where people build a house on 30 acres and then they turn that whole 30 acres into a Bermuda grass golf course, essentially around their house. They've destroyed everything of value in that landscape uh, in, from an ecological perspective. So those things are beginning to impact the valley on top of the farming. It's all fixable, it's all doable. Uh, it, it, the valley is compatible with human experience, uh, but we, we should be thoughtful about how we, how we have that experience and how it affects the valley, and we should be ready to learn from the valley. Uh, but yeah, there are impacts. Yeah, I hear that. Well, I love hearing your passion for uh, this project from both of you, and we're about out of time, but I thought I'd just uh, end with one question. What is a plant or animal that you're particularly passionate about? Because I see both of you light up when you talk about certain things. I know it's hard to pick one, but like, what's a, a fun one that you connect to? 
um, because I think that's kind of helps all of us if we can make a connection with an with a particular species. Oh, I stumped them. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you said, it's hard to just pick one because I mean, it's fun looking at the whole just picture and the, you know, the interactions and relationships that that's probably one of the most fun parts is the ecology of it to me. Yeah, how they how they interact is, is what's always fascinating. And, you know, the, the thing about a diverse forest is it's diversity. Uh, it's not one thing. It's it's everything. And we, we have a hard time with diversity. Diversity is very hard for most of us to digest. We we like things simple. We don't mm. want we don't want things to be different. And the cool thing about paint rock is everything's different. It's not uh, it's not like other places. And Every tree you go to is, 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 is a new experience. It's, it's really interesting, every plant. So it's really hard to pick. You can't make us do it. We won't do it. We refuse to do it. Uh, let, me, uh, let, me add, let me add one quick thing before we run out of time. If any of, us, if any of you want to follow, there's a lot to follow here. Uh, if you'd like to follow what we're doing, we have a website called paintrock.org, paintrock.org. Uh, all one word, paintrock.org, and you can follow us there. And uh, we hope we'll continue to have a dialogue uh, with the land trust and with the people uh, of the Tennessee Valley. Wonderful. I'm putting that in the uh, in the chat for folks who are on Facebook so they can find that. That's excellent. Yeah, I loved your answer that that it's it's not one species. It's that they're all connected. That's that's just makes sense. And that's a good a reminder because that is kind of how we think. Often we think about one species and that's just kind of a, a great big picture analogy. It's that web all connected. Well, I wanna thank everybody for joining us tonight with the Land Trust of North Alabama. And thank you too so much, Patience and Bill for filling us in, teaching us about this amazing, amazing space that most of us don't know much about. And um, and so it's, it's it's wonderful that you're conducting the research, um, but also that you're uh, sharing that knowledge, you know, and getting getting the information out here. For those of us, for those of you who are listening, we're uh, the Land Trust of North Alabama. We'll be providing more live events like this. We're really excited about uh, future events. So stay tuned. Uh, tune in to the Facebook page, and you'll you'll uh, be updated on the next one. So thanks so much, and I hope you all have a great night. Thanks.